At 2.13 a.m. on December 2nd, 2025, the frozen silence of Mordovia was shattered by the scream of 30mm autocannons. Eleven Ukrainian drones were executing a suicide dive directly into the muzzle flash of a Russian Panzer S-2. Just 48 hours after Putin rejected a peace deal, Kiev sent its answer at 118 miles per hour. If these drones miss Russia, keeps its monopoly on fiber optic warfare. But if they hit the eyes of the Russian military, go blind forever. Margin for error zero. Time to impact nine seconds. This plan relied on the one thing machines aren't supposed to have sacrifice. Seven minutes to impact. High above the frozen plains of Mordovia, a shadow weighing exactly 155 pounds is skirting just 800 feet above the frozen plains. This is the FP-1 mother drone. Cruising at 115 miles per hour, its electric motors are barely purring at 17% capacity. Why 17%? Because at 18%, the thermal signature becomes visible to Russian sensors. It is walking a digital tightrope 130 feet off the deck. 400 miles away in a Kiev bunker, Colonel Oleksiy grips the console. On his tactical display, a massive red overlay dominates the screen. This is the kill zone of the Nebo-M, a Russian radar beast capable of tracking 300 targets from 400 miles away. It's the Eye of Sauron for the Russian Aerospace Forces. Inside that ring sits a smaller, deadlier circle, the 12-mile engagement envelope of the Panzer S-2. And right in the bullseye, the optic fiber systems plant. To a civilian, it's a factory. To Alexei, it's the only place on Earth keeping the Russian drone fleet immune to jamming. Destroying it doesn't just stop production. It burns the blueprint for Russia's future war machine. For the last 400 miles, the mission has been a masterclass in stealth. The drone swarm is riding a low-level jet stream, a 60-mile-per-hour tailwind that masks their ground speed. To the Russian radar operators in Saransk, the 155-pound composite bodies of the drones look exactly like a drifting snowstorm. They still think it's weather, Oleksiy mutters. But the physics of war are about to shift. The ambient temperature outside is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. While this Arctic freeze is great for cooling the drone's motors, it is about to turn into a fatal liability. As the drones descend for the attack run, they have to throttle up. Hot lithium batteries against a freezing cold background don't look like clouds. Through a thermal imager, they look like flares in a dark room. The Nebo-M operator in Saransk is pouring his third cup of coffee bored out of his mind. He has no idea that in exactly seven miles, his snowstorm is going to bank left throttle up to 125 miles per hour and try to punch a hole through his billion-dollar air defense network. The countdown hits six minutes. The wind is dying down, the cover is blowing, and the hunt is on. At 60 miles out, the jet stream shifts. To stay on schedule, the Ukrainian mother drones must throttle up. The moment their ground speed exceeds the wind vector by five knots, the Nebo-M's Doppler filters strip away the weather classification. In Saransk, the storm turns crimson. Anomaly detected bearing 210, speed increasing. It's not wind. Now begins the deadliest race in modern warfare. It's a race between the Ukrainian drones flying at 100 knots and the Russian command signals traveling through the copper wires of their old telephone network. The order Condition 1 screams down the line toward the factory defenders. The drone swarm covers the next 53 miles in 28 agonizing minutes. Every second brings them closer to the Panzer's kill zone. Seven miles from the target, the Russian air defense network finally wakes up fully, but it is 30 seconds too late to stop the delivery. The first five FP-1 motherships pitch up at 2,000 feet. Belly hatches snap open, gravity takes over. Twenty Wild Hornet drones tumble into the freezing slipstream. These are the brawlers, cheap, aggressive, and expendable. But the sixth FP-1, trailing slightly behind, carries a different payload. It drops four Colibri drones. These aren't suicide bombers. They are carrying the laser link terminals, the only way to break through the jamming that is about to start. Relieved of 130 pounds, the motherships bank hard left and dive for home. Their job is done. The swarm they just birthed, however, is entering the meat grinder. The 20 Wild Hornets scatter like a shotgun blast. Their AI boots up, initiating the stop and go protocol. Down below, the Panzer S2 radar systems are screaming. These systems rely on Doppler prediction, calculating where a target will be in four seconds based on where it is now. But the Ukrainian code is rewriting the math. The Wild Hornets sprint at 90 MPR, then suddenly hover. Sprint left. Hover. Sprint right. Hover. 
Every time a drone hovers, its radial velocity drops to zero. To the Doppler radar, it effectively disappears, blending into the static of the frozen trees. Inside the command vehicle, the tracking symbols jitter like a glitchy video game. The computer screams, Trajectory prediction failed! Radar lock unstable! The Russian gunner yells, fighting the stick. I can't get a tone! The Russian commander realizes the radar is useless. He slams a switch. Forget the radar switch to thermal, look for the heat. This is the move Ukraine feared. The Panzer's 10 ES-1 thermal eye opens scanning the 8 to 14 micron spectrum. The air is minus 12 degrees Celsius. The landscape is dead cold, but the wild hornets. The violent stop and go maneuvers are cooking their lithium batteries to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. On the Russian screens, 20 brilliant white dots erupt against the black background. The invisible ghosts just became glowing light bulbs. Visual contact, the gunner grins. Guns selected. The Panzer's twin 2A38M 30mm cannons spin up. They don't fire single shots. They vomit high explosive tungsten at 5,000 rounds per minute. That is 83 rounds per second. The first volley is a sigh of the fire. It catches the lead group of three wild hornets mid hover. They never stood a chance. The 30 mm shells, each carrying 48 grams of hexyl explosive, don't just break the drones, they atomize them. One moment they are advanced machines, the next they are a cloud of carbon fiber dust and burning lithium. Target destroyed switching. The Russian gunner is good. He's ignored the computer. He is aiming manually, hunting the white thermal dots like a video game on easy mode. He swings the turret left. The fourth drone tries to dive. Too slow. A single round clips its rotor arm. The kinetic energy of a projectile traveling at 3200 feet per second rips the limb off. The drone spins wildly, crashing into the frozen earth in a fireball. The fifth and sixth drones try to swarm the panzer from opposite angles. The gunner doesn't panic. He walks the tracers across the sky. The shells are fused to detonate on proximity. They don't even need to hit. They just need to get close. Two airbursts shred the plastic bodies with tungsten shrapnel. Up in the sky, the formation is breaking. The stop-and-go tactic that fooled the radar is now suicidal against a human gunner who can see them glowing. In 18 seconds of absolute violence, nine wild hornets are wiped from the sky. The field below is littered with burning wreckage. But the real crisis is just beginning. The gunner shifts his aim. He locks onto a cluster of four slower-moving targets in the rear. These are the Colibri drones, the ones carrying the laser link. The only hope for the mission. The crosshairs settle on them. The gunner squeezes the trigger. The barrels spin. Ukraine has 38 seconds before the mission fails. The barrels are spinning. The first tracers are already leaving the muzzle racing toward the four helpless Colibri drones. But the Russian gunner made one critical mistake. He got greedy. In his obsession with hunting the easy kills, he ignored the 11 remaining wild hornets that he hadn't shot down. He thought they were fleeing. He was wrong. They were flanking. Inside the swarm's neural network, a logic gate flips from evade to execute. The AI realizes it cannot win a gunfight, so it decides to win a knife fight. A the 11 surviving wild hornets stop their erratic dancing. They synchronize, and then they dive. They aren't aiming for the panzer's hull that is armored steel. They are aiming for the glass jaw. The delicate unarmored optics module is sitting on top of the turret, the thermal eye that is guiding the guns. Incoming high angle, the Russian commander screams, but the turret is too heavy. It can't traverse up fast enough. The physics of angular velocity are now on Ukraine's side. The first Hornet takes a 30 millimeter round to the face and evaporates. The second one clips the radar dish and spins away. But the third, fourth, and fifth Hornets they don't miss. Three shaped charges detonate directly on the 10 ES-1 sensor suite. There is no massive fireball, just a precise, brutal, concussive slap that shatters lenses, melts circuit boards, and rips the thermal camera from its housing. Inside the panzer, the screens go black. I'm blind, I've lost the video, sensors are down, the gunner screams, slamming his fist on the console. Outside, the turret spins wildly, firing blindly into the night sky, but without eyes, it is just a loud, useless metal box. Silence falls over the battlefield. The guns stop. Five wild hornets died to buy this silence. But they didn't die alone. Scattered across the sky, hiding in the tree lines and behind rooftops are the survivors. Six wild hornets made it through the slaughter. They were the ones lurking at the edges, waiting for the Alpha Strike to clear the path. Now they rise. Without the Panzer's radar painting them, they are free. Now. 
Colonel Alexei whispers in Kiev. High above the smoke, the four Colibri drones stabilize. They deploy a small, strange-looking pod. It looks like a camera lens, but it doesn't take pictures. It shoots light. Click. The laser link activates. A beam of invisible 1550 nanometer light shoots back toward the relay pod, drifting under a parachute miles away. This is free space optical communication. Radio waves spread out like a floodlight. They are easy to jam. Lasers are like a sniper shot, tight focused and impossible to intercept unless you physically block the beam. The Russian Krasuka 4 jamming station in the distance is blasting enough noise to deafen every radio in the hemisphere. It doesn't matter. The laser beam cuts right through the electronic noise. On Alexei's screen in Kiev, the Connection Lost banner flickers and turns green. Link established, bandwidth 2 gigabits, latency 4 milliseconds. The image pops up. It is crystal clear. 4K resolution. No static, no lag. It looks like he is hovering right above the factory roof. We have control, Alexei says. But here is the real genius of the Ukrainian plan. The Colibri drones aren't just bombers, they are routers. They broadcast a short-range encrypted signal to the six surviving wild hornets below. The swarm is back online. Ten drones, ten warheads. Oleksiy's team in Kiev isn't just looking at one screen. They have ten live feeds. The target below is massive. The optic fiber systems plant sprawls over four acres. Intelligence has identified the critical nodes. Not the offices, not the warehouse. The silica draw towers. These are three massive three-story tall ovens where pure glass preforms are melted and pulled into fiber strands thinner than human hair. They operate at 3600 degrees Fahrenheit. They are delicate, expensive, and absolutely irreplaceable. Target assignment. Alexei commands, Team Alpha 3 Hornets on the power substation. Cut the cooling. Colibri team and remaining Hornets precision strikes on the towers. The math of destruction is simple. The draw towers need constant cooling. If the power dies, the molten glass inside solidifies, ruining the machines forever. If you add a few pounds of high explosive to that mix, you don't get a broken machine, you get a volcanic eruption inside a building. The countdown hits 43 seconds. The swarm aligns its vectors. The Panzer crew can only listen to the buzz of 10 engines growing louder, helpless to stop what comes next. The swarm dives, 10 drones against a factory defended by a blind giant. But the Russians aren't giving up. The Panzer commander pops the hatch, ignoring the freezing cold. He grabs a man pads, a shoulder-fired Igla missile. It's a desperate move, like trying to shoot a mosquito with a bazooka. He doesn't have a lock tone. He doesn't care. He fires the missile straight up, hoping the proximity fuse will catch something. The missile screams into the sky, leaving a trail of white smoke. It misses the Colibri drones by 50 feet, but the blast wave slams into one of the trailing wild hornets. The small drone tumbles its gyro shattered and slams into the factory parking lot, detonating harmlessly against a concrete barrier. Nine drones left. Team Alpha hits first. Three wild hornets slam into the 110 kilovolt substation powering the plant. The transformers explode, spraying boiling oil and ceramic shrapnel everywhere. A massive blue arc of electricity snaps through the air, then darkness. The entire factory goes black. The cooling pumps for the silica ovens die instantly. Inside the plant alarms are screaming on battery power. The temperature inside the draw towers begins to spike uncontrollably. The molten glass is no longer flowing. It is building up pressure. Now the main event. The four Colibri drones and the two remaining wild hornets line up for the kill shot on the main production hall. But there is one final obstacle. The roof. It's reinforced corrugated steel designed to withstand heavy snow loads. A standard drone might bounce off or detonate on the surface, leaving the machinery inside untouched. The two remaining wild hornets are the breach team. They dive at full throttle, 120 miles per hour. They don't carry fragmentation warheads. They carry shaped charges, copper cones designed to punch through tank armor. They hit the roof directly above draw tower number one and number two. Two bright flashes. Two neat molten holes punch through the steel decking. The path is open. Thread the needle, Oleksi whispers. The four Colibri drones dive through the smoke. The feed shifts to the dark interior, lit only by the red glow of the failing ovens. They target the hydrogen tanks and the base of the massive silica towers. Four thermobaric warheads detonate simultaneously. A 4,000 degree fireball consumes the oxygen instantly. The hydrogen tanks rupture, blowing the roof off the building. The delicate machinery doesn't just break, 
It melts into a puddle of fused glass and steel. On Alexei's screen, the feed turns to static as the last drone fulfills its purpose. 2.20 a.m. The silence returns to Mordovia, but this time it is the silence of a graveyard. The smoke over Saransk clears, but the real damage has just become invisible. Ukraine spent roughly $400,000 on this entire drone swarm. In exchange, they destroyed a facility worth an estimated $1.2 billion. Even Apple stock doesn't give you returns like that. But the money is the least of Russia's problems. Intelligence confirms that the silica draw towers are gone. These machines are custom built. Replacing them will take 14 to 18 months. This means the Gerbera drone project, Russia's plan to flood the front lines with jam-proof fiber optic drones, is dead in the water until at least 2027. And here is a question for you. If you were the Russian commander, what would you do now? Do you keep your air defense on the front line and risk losing your industry? Or do you pull it back and leave your troops exposed? Let me know your strategy in the comments below. Bye for now.